All right, welcome everybody. This is October 17th, 2019. This meeting of the Northam City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell, the council president, so I'll be running the meeting. And the meeting is being audio and video recorded. So let's start with public comment. Uh, I have two people signed up, and afterwards, anyone who hasn't signed up, you can still talk. Uh, so excuse me if I say your name incorrectly, but Megan Paik, if you would, um, well, say whatever you want. Welcome. It's fine. Uh, you, you're fine. You can yeah. leave that. We're picking you up. Yep. Um, my name is Megan Paik. Um, I'm a member of Support for the passage of the Safe City Ordinance. Um, let me begin by opining that um, this ordinance itself will not catalyze immigrants and other vulnerable people to report the discrimination and abuse that they face about the profligate conduct they are committed against them in their health We will take an whole number of changes on the federal level and a profound shift in raising class relations among many other things for this country to be truly safe for many immigrants. I speak as an immigrant to America at age six who became an American in early adulthood during my dozen plus years of citizenship. Um, our interactions with authority figures were often officious and even terrifying. Very blind to watch your personal information when I needed shots. Or in the video after cutting my shin open. A beloved teacher advised me not to apply to college or live out of state until I was legal. We had little cash to spare, but we always had $200 on hand for, to contribute to a police power fund that a uniform officer would regularly. As much as we appreciated our newfound access to public schools, social services, hospitals, and <coughs> enforcement, <coughs> the fear of imperiling our chance of citizenship undermined many of our choices and opportunities, like the undocumented immigrants that the Safe City Ordinance seeks to protect. My family had come to the country with little formal education and resources. For a long time, our lives were characterized more by struggle than by stability. It was immaterial to us, who was president or whether the planet was one of us in the city. But we constantly dreaded and reported the INS for payment of late, or just for setting off the kitchen fire alarm too many times. We were living in a town back then, the city ordinance had made a difference to our quality of life and perceived sense of safety. Perhaps because it is a body recognition of immigrants who work in rights. In this era, um, not unprecedented, but certain heightened uh, danger from many minorities, including non Americans, <coughs> only need to codify this law in the new humanity of all of us. So, candidly, I hope that the passage of this ordinance will commit ordinary citizens like ourselves with relative power, privilege, and security to enact and implement these policies in an impactful way. Many who are counting on already back up in tenants. Share your time, skills, funds, etc., to improve the welfare of new immigrants. We take life center training and we offer English and acculturation classes to immigrants and refugees. We make decisions, consciously or not, subtly or courageously, to be advocates for those around us who live with less security. We should pass a safe city ordinance, but acknowledge that it is only one of many small but meaningful local actions. Remember that is what happens on a community and individual level. The discretionary acts of human kindnesses and gestures and inclusion and acceptance that really manifest our love and builds a sense of safety and trust in our community for our immigrant and Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those eloquent comments. <coughs> um, Alex Jarrett. Alex Jarrett, High Street Farms. Um, I want to speak in favor of the Safe City Ordinance. I believe our immigration system at present is deeply flawed, and people who come here are often from countries where our foreign policy has uh, made it unsafe or damaged the economy. Um, 
we live in a society where products have more freedom of movement than people. And um, if undocumented people fear dealing with our local government, then we, that makes it less safe for everyone, safe to report crimes uh, to, and to participate in community government. Uh, I want my friends who are undocumented to be as safe as we can make it here, for them to feel um, that, that you know, we as a city are supporting them and that they feel safe in, in talking to anyone in city government. And um, so I urge you to pass the Safe City Amendment I also wanted to talk about a different issue. Um, I'm running for office, and as I'm going door to door, um, an issue that a lot of people talk about is traffic safety. And um, I wanted to make the connection between traffic calming and roads, road repair. Um, so someone called me from who lives on Florence Road and to speak about um, the, the many very heavy trucks that are speeding down Florence Road. And um, the, the issue is that not only is there a safety concern with, of course, uh, any vehicle speeding, but there's also that speed and weight are major factors in road damage. Uh, it's exponentially higher if you have a heavy weight vehicle uh, going faster than you know a car going at a regular speed. And so when we think about the funds that we're thinking about you know, allocating for various things, we need to think about, well, slowing down especially trucks is going to actually save us money on the roads as well. Um, so just wanted to make that connection. It's something that you know, people uh, around the city are really, it's on their minds. Um, and. Uh, Thanks, Phyllis. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on any subject? So, please, you come. <coughs> I'm, who are you? <laughs> come on up. Hello, everybody. I know uh, a few of you from my past lives here as a teacher in Northampton. And, um, it's uh, a wonderful place to live and work. Well, I'm not telling you about all. However, I do want to talk about something that is uh, very near and dear because um, it has to do with a very recent understanding and change to the way um, we can view in and out of our city. It's a wonderful thing with our new Amtrak service. I hope many of you have either thought about it or have been on it, but um, it is a terrific uh, new uh, endeavor and it's growing the city beautifully. And in fact, if anything, they say that a depot should be the gateway. People are coming here and, and they're seeing the city for the first time. And when you come off your train or when you're arriving, you're impressed, hopefully. So um, we do take the train. My partner and I do take the train um, on a monthly basis. We've been taking the train since we moved up here back in uh, 2003 out of the Amherst area. But uh, recently, over the last few years, we have been having to rely on the train uh, for medical uh, purposes. My partner and I go down every month, and um, it is uh, very important to us that we have access, easy access, to the train. And of late, we haven't had easy access, just recently, as a matter of fact. So um, I understand that uh, the uh, city here has got into a contract or an understanding with the owners, the private owners of that lot. Um, it, to us, we thought it was a public lot, but uh, it isn't. So uh, it is privately owned, and they've made some changes. They've only given us 15 minutes to load and unload, which is impossible, because not only in the 15 minutes you have people with issues getting in and out of the car, we haven't even dealt with the weather yet, but you also have um, a train that is notoriously late. Today, at 2.42, the train arrived, and it was supposed to be there at 2.01. I think in my five years of travel, it only has arrived on time maybe once or twice. And now with the Valley Flyer, it has a great um, uh, capability to getting people down to New York and back, or down to their jobs maybe along the way, and back in the same day. It's magnificent, really. So please use it. However, you only have 15 minutes to get in and out of there before you get charged. And we've never had that before. Um, so. 
Uh, I'm just asking that if you're thinking about changing any ordinances or uh, contractual uh, agreements with these people, I'm sure they're wonderful people. They want to grow the city too, <clears throat> and entertain and and uh, you know support uh, business. It's great, but give us a little bit of flexibility there. That toll gate is something that. I've never seen before in this town. We have a toll gate that lets us in and out, but in only in the uh, gear garage, but it's an hour. Here it's only 15 minutes. You can't, I, I saw today, people were parked blocking, they didn't want to go in to lock. So they were blocking the rest of the traffic. So if anybody has any questions, I did send my, uh, uh, my uh, earlier presentation to uh, Mr. Nash and his commission, and I got a wonderful, no back saying that they were going to look into some of these items I mentioned. 20,000 riders this year so far on the Amtrak. And that's going to grow. And it's going to grow the city and all the cities along the line. It's a marvelous thing. I hope to see you there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And it's a good example because we have this funny rule where we don't engage, we go back and forth with people. Right. So, the city council is surprised. Why are you questions? But we should do. You should do what she has done, which is talk to your counselor individually. Uh, so that's good. We have the chair of the transportation and pardon commission yes, talking with you. Uh, so terrific, good. Uh, good. Exchange. So Thank having you. said that, is there anyone else? Yeah. Sir, come on up. Can you give your name and um, you don't have to give your full address, but town you live in. Jack Bolton, uh, and I live at uh, on Burt's Pit Road. Uh, I'm here to advocate in favor of the Safe City Ordinance uh, for all the reasons that the first two speakers gave uh, and also some more. Uh, I've been working on this issue, as some of you know, for quite some time, back to 2010 and 2011 when communities found themselves voluntarily, assist, sometimes accidentally, assisting the federal government uh, with the historically increased scrutiny of undocumented immigrants. Uh, I was happy to work to see Springfield take the lead on the issue, and then that happened here in Northampton, um, that particularly the city council um, uh, passed a resolution with the ex expressing the desire to not take on that work of the federal government. Um, that resolution here in Northampton was followed up with an executive order, uh, which was among the first in Western Massachusetts, in which uh, directs the chief of the police department to ter take certain steps um, now, about five years later, we find ourselves in an even more divisive climate. Uh, cities and now entire states, in the case of Washington and California, have been codifying their desire to not voluntarily do the bidding of, in this case, the Trump administration. This has taken the form of state legislation, and in Massachusetts, ordinances and bylaws that establish that municipalities will not expend their resources doing something that is exclusively the role of the federal government. Uh, the Resistance Center, of which I belong, along with the Immigrant Protection Project, uh, have been working from Springfield to Greenfield, from Amherst to East Hampton, and a couple more places uh, to codify that in those communities. Uh, it's no longer sufficient to merely direct a singular department or personnel to respond in a certain way. It is time, for many reasons, uh, for, for, for municipalities and states um, as a whole to codify and put into policy their intention to retain their own resources, our own resources, for our own important and impressing needs, not for attacking the most vulnerable among us. Uh, Northampton won't be the first in this case, but I'm sure it won't be the last. And the passage of this ordinance will put our city in line with what's becoming a consensus of civility <coughs> among people of goodwill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else like to speak on any subject? Oh, come on. You don't look like a shy bunch to me. <laughs> No? Okay. Anyone like my tie? Don't like my tie? <laughs> Someone angry about national politics? <laughs> like to do a barking dog near your house? <laughs> right. So always next time. So thank you very much. Hearing no other public comment, we will uh, convene. And so I sort of roll the council. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labar. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor Donald. Here. Here. Okay, so we're all here. And the first thing I will do is announce um, public hearings to consider laying out portions of Finn Street and North Street. Uh, pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 82, Section 21, the City Council Committee on City Services will hold public hearings uh, here in the City Council Chambers on Monday, November 4th, 2019, at uh, 4 30 p.m. 
and 4.35 p.m. respectively uh, to consider laying out portions of the following public ways. Finn Street from Prospect Street to King Street and North Street from King Street to Market Street. Any person interested or wishing to be heard thereon should appear at the time and place designated. Next is another announcement of a public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2020 tax levy. Uh, Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, November 7th, 2019 at 705 in the City Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton, Mass, to discuss the percentages of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property within the City of Northampton for fiscal year 2020 in accordance with Chapter 40 section. 56 of the Mass General Laws. Information regarding this issue will be available for public <coughs> inspection in the City Clerk's Office on or before November 5th, 2019, uh, after 12 p.m. Okay, so that's something that we do every year, we ratio of, you know, among other things, residential <coughs> commercial tax rate, um, which is now one. The ratio is one now. So updates from me. Um, so I have an announcement regarding the executive session minutes. The open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 22, requires public bodies to regularly review minutes of executive sessions. So uh, Council President Me has determined that since, uh, since all the fiscal year 2016 through fiscal year 2019 and fiscal 2020 through fiscal 22 contracts, meaning uh, uh, collective bargaining contracts, have been settled. Executive session minutes of February 21st, 2019, March 21st, 2019, June 5th, 2019, and August 15th, 2019 may now be released. <coughs> I just did that. I just released them by doing that. Um, however, due to pending litigation, um, continued non disclosure <laughs> to the opposite. Uh, of executive session minutes for the following meetings, November 16th, 2017, and September 19th, 2019, uh, are still warranted. So the law says I have to make that announcement periodically. Um, so that takes care of me. Anyone else have announcements? Councilor Dwight, then Councilor LaBarge. Uh, <clears throat> providing an update on the uh, Charter Review Committee meeting that we had uh, this last Tuesday. Um, we are wrapping things up. Um, there is uh, the <clears throat> final report at the draft stage, and that was principally the focus of discussion. There was public comment um, uh, to the effect that uh, calling for a consideration of allowing uh, people with uh, protective status or un undocumented uh, residents who don't would not otherwise qualify for the right to vote. There was a, uh, an appeal for a consideration of that, and there was some discussion further. Um, probably a more expansive conversation on that point at our next meeting, which is actually we're inviting members of the public who have yet to participate or, or even follow what we're uh, discussing at Jackson Street School in the in the in the gymnasium. I'm sorry, at 6:30 on October 29th and hoping that people will be there who have not been able to participate so far in this conversation. Um, and then, of course, there were, and then we were working on editing a letter of summary that is going to be referred to the mayor, <clears throat> talking about other issues that came up that weren't necessarily germane to the charter, uh, that didn't reach the threshold of, of, of charter proposed changes. Um, and one of them being, of course, the conversation that I mentioned last time, which was accessibility, uh, information <coughs> accessibility, and how to improve and enhance it. Uh, everyone acknowledged that the information is available, but not everyone feels particularly comfortable or uh, capable of, of locating that information. So that was our recommendation to the mayor. Um, and that was it. So the date on that is the 29th? The 29th. Tuesday. Yeah, October 29th. It's a Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, at Jackson, Jackson Street. School Jackson Street, Street, excuse me. There will be translators available as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, Councilor Barch. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank the director of the Department of Public Works and all my residents who worked very tirelessly with me to make Pertzbet Road 
and Glendale Road, a road that you can drive safely on. And Mayor, thank you. Thank you for the many site visits with me on Pertzbit Road and Glendale Road. And I can't tell you how many calls have come to my home. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nash and then Councilor Bidwell. Yeah, just a quick announcement. Uh, the committee, your select committee on pesticide reduction will be meeting on, we're, we're holding another hearing on Monday here at 10 o'clock. Um, the, the public is welcome to come and provide us any input on the topic. And it's also being publicized as a council meeting. Mm -hmm. So any mm -hmm. of our, uh, my co our colleagues here are welcome to show up. And, um, and we are, we have November 10th, our deadline firmly focused on, and we will have a report to you. Thank you. And what's the name, uh, the acronym for your uh, committee again? Yes, your Skipper. Excuse me? Skipper. I didn't hear you. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Thanks. Skipper. <laughs> oh, that's, that's actually good. So we look forward to that. Uh, we had Councilor Pidwell. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Want to be sure folks knew that the, the Daily Hampshire Gazette is sponsoring a forum next week. They're calling it the future of downtown Northampton. It's a follow-up to their series of articles on the, on the state of downtown. And it will be this coming Wednesday, October 23rd, from 5.30 to 7 at Click Workspace, 9 and a half Market Street. So I would encourage anyone interested in joining a conversation about downtown to be there. Thank you very much. Any other announcements from councilors? Councilor Klein. I want <clears throat> to let people know that uh, Friends of Northampton Trails and Tree Northampton are sponsoring um, on Sunday, October 20th, so this coming Sunday, the Great Tree Bike Tour. Um, you, there's a route, an eight mile route, and it features all of the great trees of Northampton. You get an audio recording, um, and you listen to stories at each stop, and you learn about the city's notable trees, including three champion trees, which means that they're the largest of their species in Massachusetts. Um, you have to register by Saturday night at midnight. It's $15, and um, you can find more information on Friends of Northampton Trail's website. Thank you very much, Councilor Klein. Any other um, announcements? <laughs> no. Bake sales, planning charrettes, nothing? Okay, good. So um, now we have, oh, actually, Mr. Mayor, do you have anything for us? You're not, okay. Uh, so, blah, blah, blah. So now we're at the consent agenda. Contains the following items. At the request of any one counselor, I will remove an item for a separate vote. Otherwise, no debate on the consent agenda, which contains minutes of October 3rd, 2019. Uh, the question of appointments to various committees. Um, all of the following have received positive recommendations from city services. Um, and uh, the first two, well, Here's how I'll do it. To, to the Trust Fund Committee, Catherine Foote Newman of uh, 697 Bridge Road, Northampton, uh, for a term starting July 2019, which is in the past, uh, through uh, June 2022. Okay. Uh, to the Housing Partnership, Reverend Todd Weir, 124 Moser Street, Northampton, for the same term. That's the Housing Partnership. Uh, to the Parks and Rec. Creation Committee, Catherine Elliott, excuse me, Kathleen Elliott of 39A Florence Street in Leeds uh, for term October 2019 through June 2021. To the Planning Board, Alan Verson, 508 Kennedy Road, Leeds uh, for term October 2019 to June 2022. I will remove that one for a separate vote. Uh, also to the Planning Board, David Whitehill, 60 Washington Avenue, Northampton. Uh, for a term October 2019 through 2021. Uh, he is for an associate member. Mr. Versons for full member. Move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second to that. All those in favor of the consent uh, uh, agenda. Excuse me. Yes. I need to abstain on the trust fund committee, Catherine Foot Newman. I see. Thank you. So what we will do is remove that one. Okay. So. Minus the two removals. There are two removals now. I should have been, I'm proceeding to any other removals or just to double check? Okay, good. So uh, with those two off, we had a motion made and seconded? Yes. Okay. 
So all those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? So we'll do it in uh, order. So is there a motion to approve the appointment of Catherine Foote Newman to the trust fund committee? So move. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion on this? Okay. Um, this can be done with a voice vote. So all those in favor of the uh, appointment, please say aye. 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 Opposed. <clears throat> and one abstention from Councilor Barge. Okay. Uh, is, do I hear a motion to appoint Alan, to approve the appointment of Alan Verson uh, to the planning board's full member? So moved. Second. Okay. okay. Any discussion on this? Uh, my position is the same as it was the last time we voted on this, which is a matter of public record, and I don't want to relitigate it because last time I lost uh, seven to two, so, <laughs> but my position is the same, so. Um, no interest in really getting into it, but I'm going to vote in the negative. Any further discussion on this? Okay. All those in favor of the appointment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. So that is approved. Uh, now we will recess for finance. Excellent. Laura, would you call our roll, please? Murphy. Here. Present. Present. Here. Thank you. Our first uh, item is approval of the minutes of October 3rd. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Excellent. Any discussion on the motion? <laughs> All in favor of the minutes, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Um, and then the big item tonight is our first quarter financial report from Finance Director Susan Wright. Well, she's gotten um, two reports from me. Uh, the first one is the revenues for the general fund. Um, the this is the first quarter, so it's not a whole lot here, but everything is tracking exactly the way we thought. Um, I will note that um, hotel motel tax is up about 2.5%. Uh, um, it could be in part to the new uh, Airbnb tax, but we don't know because they're giving us the money all lot together, so we really don't know how much of that is new, um, new uh, picking up new revenue there. Um, the uh, adult use marijuana excise um, for the first quarter is in as well, and you'll see it um, on the line just below hotel, motel, and meals. Um, the parking revenue is as we expect. It looks um, pretty, pretty robust. Um, and there really isn't anything else in here that uh, I, I would call your attention to. Everything's pretty much tracking the way that we would think um, at the end of the first quarter. Um, in terms of the general fund expenses, um, that is a longer report. And again, if you look, um, the percentages are somewhat of a guide, um, but not all of them, because there are some departments that pay a lot of um, things up front at the beginning of the fiscal year. So uh, I wouldn't get too wrapped up in the percentages. But I do look at these salary percentages at this point figure out how many payrolls have gone by and where we should be a salary if anybody's right where we should be, or perhaps a little bit below because there may be some vacancies in their department. So there's nothing really to call your attention to there. Um, then the other two reports are the revenues and the expenditures for the Accor Enterprise Funds. And again, the revenues, all of the funds are between uh, 24 and 26% uh, for revenue, so that's all. Um, as we would expect. And then the expenditures for the enterprise funds um, are, again, as we expect, that percentages are a little low because there are a lot of uh, encumbered funds that come over for some of the larger projects in the enterprise funds. So that's why some of the percentages of use may seem a little low, but those, those projects will be proceeding as we expect. So are there any questions on uh, Councilor Bidwell. Um, you mentioned on Hotel Motel that the Airbnb revenues are all lumped in together. Well, is there any prospect of that being separated out? Because it would be very, very helpful to be able to look at them individually. to them that it would be very helpful for us to be able to tease it right. out. Um, but at this point, this is what we have right now. But we have definitely 
uh, my office has expressed it to them, and I know it's something we brought to MMA as well. Um, the other piece of it is, you know, the state does have um, their own sort of registration data, right. um, but that still would make it hard to figure that out because you don't know. It doesn't you know, register, but it doesn't tell you how much how much more occupancy they had. So, uh, yes, noted, and we've been a little frustrated by it, um, but we're working on that. Do we have access to that registry at this point? Um, at this point, it would be through the Department of Revenue, um, and. Uh, we haven't. We actually have had registrations locally. Mm -hmm. We have had people that have been registering locally and as we've uh, been requiring them to. Um, but again, it's, you can't draw a correlation between the revenue. Or, you know, it's hard to figure out what the percentage of right. the revenue would be. But um, but that is a frustration that we have in terms of isolating. It. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the finance director? I'm hearing none, then a motion to accept her report. Second. Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, now we have some financial orders. The first one is 19151, an order to authorize payment of a prior year bill. Order that the council authorizes the payment of a $1,885.22 prior year bill for FY19 for the parking maintenance division to Park Tech. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Second. And uh, any extra information on this one you can give us? In the machines. Yes. Any questions on the rolls of tape for the parking machines? Okay, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, and the next one is 19152. This is Community Preservation Committee um, request to transfer appropriate funds for the FY 2020 Community Preservation uh, Purposes. Order that the following amounts be appropriated or reserved from the fiscal year 2020 Community Preservation Fund estimated revenues of $1,564,000. Um, that's one million three hundred and twelve. FY local assessments plus a $252 estimate in the state match for the fiscal 2020 community preservation purpose. Um, so this is how they split up from the uh, the mandatory uses. $172,000 from the FY 20 total estimated CPA revenue to the community preservation fund for open space reserve. The same amount, 172 from the FY 20 estimated CPA revenue to the community preservation fund for historic preservation, 172,000 from the FY20 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Reserve Fund for affordable housing, 70,000 from the FY20 estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund administrative account, and $978,500 from the FY20 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund budgeted reserve account. Also, the following amounts be appropriated from the Community Preservation Fund budgeted reserve for the Community Preservation Bonding Payment Purposes. This is things that have been granted that, that money is borrowed on. Uh, 60000 for principal and nine hundred or $9,975 for interest for the Bean Farm Bond, $95,000 for principal and $21,750 for interest for the Florence Fields Bond. 265000 for principal and $13,250 for interest for the Pulaski Park Number 1 bond, $65,000 <coughs> for principal and $18,000 for interest for the Pulaski Park Number 2 bond. And uh, that is all of them. So do we have a motion in finance? I, I would like to talk to Susan, please. We Move upon Susan. the recommendation. Hmm? Second. Okay, now we can go. Okay. On the, uh, the bonds that we have here, um, <clears throat> interest on this. How long are these bonds for? Each one of these projects was bonded for a different uh, time period, and they also were bonded during different years. So I can get that information I for appreciate. the next meeting, just so you know where we are in the repayment schedule for all four of them. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the finance director on these? Very good. Then hearing no questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And the last one is 19154, in order to authorize the surplus of 5.25 acres on East Hampton Road. 
This is on the recommendation of the mayor and planning and sustainability. Whereas on August 17, 2017, the city council authorized the city to buy 55 acres of land with approximately 50 acres for the Rocky Hill Conservation Area on East Hampton Road and 5.25 uh, 5 acres for future economic development, solar, solar voltaics, or municipal use. And whereas the 5.25 acre parcel is described in a deed recorded in book um, 128. Five, seven, page 9 in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds and whereas there is a demand where whereas if there is a demand the city would be best served by selling the 5.25 acre parcel for economic development order that the City Council declares this 5.25 acre parcel surplus to the needs of the city and authorizes the mayor to sell the parcel subject to any restrictions the mayor deems appropriate do we have a motion make a motion second second and the mayor's here for questions so you may remember um, there was uh, the acquisition that happened in the Rocky Hill Conservation Area uh, where the uh, uh, large chunk of property was added to our conservation holdings. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, um, the city retained a 5.25 acre parcel, which we um, were putting aside for some potential use, potentially economic development, potentially uh, solar, uh, potentially municipal uses. Um, I should say that it's not currently land that's accessible. Um, it's uh, and there's no um, sewer to the land. Um, it's actually as you're driving along Route 10 along the right. There's a rather steep hill. Um, this is before uh, Sunnyside Daycare, sort of that whole stretch of land. Um, there is a private landowner that's been trying to develop on the property um, and has had some challenges with that, um, and so. Um, we believe that at this point we don't see any potential use for it and it would be better served going back on the tax roll. So we want to at least put it out and see whether or not there's any potential interest in it. So, so there's, there's no particular buyer at this point, but we would authorize you if one comes along to right. yes. negotiate a transaction. The surplus of the surplus is going to allow. I mean, you know, one potential there is, as I said, there's another property owner who's doing some development or seeking to do some development, they may be interested in the land, we don't know, uh, but there may be someone else. They would probably have to partner with this other developer because again, the site costs of um, providing access to this land, to where it's you know, flat, will require some serious site work to create a driveway. And then there's the issue of bringing sewer to the site. So, um, so, um, we, again, it was sort of a residual from that initial um, uh, uh, conservation land acquisition. And uh, we believe we just want to see whether there's any actual interest in it and getting it back on the tax Council Labarge. Yes, um, I think there probably would be some interest there, especially hearing what I'm hearing, possibly a storage area. That's becoming a big thing now. Mm -hmm. And um, also like offices, mm -hmm. medical and so forth. So I think this is the right way to go. And I thank you for this. Thank you, Council. Again, Council, fine. We just, we would, this week we were just surplusing it and yeah. we would have to then put it out to bid and yeah. see whether or not there's any interest in it or not. But, yeah. Council, um, I recall that when we purchased this, there was discussion of the fact that there was a um, it was going to become part of a kind of wildlife corridor, kind of part of a ring around the city, and um, and that it would actually allow for passage in that area of particular kinds of wildlife. Yes. And so I'm just wondering how this, if this parcel is used for development, how it will, in fact, affect that goal. Yeah, it won't. And this, the, the, the specifically, the, you know, the 55 acres of land uh, the 50 acres was the piece that was contingent in the wild. That was all the wildlife area. This is a this is a parcel that's that's contiguous with the other uh, commercially developable properties. Um, so it's really not going to impact that at all. Um, and again, it was specifically um, not part of the conservation restriction on the land um, because it was land that was developable because it was you know wasn't wetlands, it wasn't part of that habitat corridor. So that's why uh, we feel that it can be, you know, again, put out to see whether or not there's some interest in it. But again, this is, you know, five acres of a 55 acre uh, acquisition, you know, 50 of which are, are forever preserved in conservation. And again, there was a, um, going way, way back, there had actually been a, you know, 
it had been zoned as an industrial, Route 10 industrial park originally. So the all that, you know, 100 acres of it was, had been zoned to be a potential future industrial park. Um, and it was primarily owned by two or three owners. Um, and one of the owners eventually decided um, that they didn't see an industrial park happening. So they were one of the big landowners that said, I want to just sell for conservation land. <coughs> Um, so that's how that came about. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely going to, you know, it's, there's a, a large area that's being preserved that's contiguous and matches up with other uh, corridors that we have. And then I would see Arcadia across the street as well. Mm -hmm. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Um, I, I understand where Councilor Klein does have that concern, but we just purchased, I, I don't know if we deeded it off yet or not, 107 acres at Pine Grove Golf Course, which is 107 acres conservation land and wildlife. So what you're talking about as far as the wildlife itself, because of this other 107 acres, also a Butson goes through, so it would not have an effect with that. Yeah. Um, we haven't actually made the purchase yet. That's what I just said. You know, the, we the, have the, not deeded or anything yeah, we on that. Pine Grove purchase. We did, get, right. we did get one of the grants that um, we had right. applied for. A land grant from the state, um, but then there's still additional funds. You're right; that is part of that whole stre stretch that connects over to where Lake Wilson Road is, um, and kind of knits that corridor together. Right. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Uh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. And that's the end of our agenda. So, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Sure. So, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. That was a great finance meeting. Solid. Now we're back in the full city council. We're going to go through some of the ones that you've already heard uh, in the full city council. So uh, first is under financial orders 19151, in order to authorize payment of a prior year bill. Second. Okay. Okay. Here, uh, someone make a motion and second. Any discussion, <clears throat> full city council? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Lamar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Yes. As approved in first reading. Next, 1952, in order to transfer appropriate transfer slash appropriate funds for fiscal year 2020 community preservation purposes. Okay. Made and seconded. Any discussion? Roll call. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay. Proved on first reading as well. Next, 1954, in order to, uh, to authorize surplus of five and a quarter acres on East Hampton Road. Motion on this, please, to approve. Made by Councillor Barge and seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. Okay, it's approved in the first reading. Now we have two on second reading. And the first is 19145 in order to authorize surplusing 593 Elm Street and leasing for child advocacy purposes. Motion. Okay. And seconded by Second. Councillor Klein. Any discussion on this one? On second reading. So roll call. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carter. Yes. And Councillor Yes. Okay, that's approved on second reading. Also on second reading, 19148. In order to authorize borrowing one and a half million dollars for paving projects. Second. Okay. May and second any discussion on this? I have always been against paving the roads. I refuse to bend to popular pressure and change my mind even at this late stage of my career. And I'm happy to support this. <laughs> Shut up. Like, what was he saying? All right, good. So we made and seconded, and it doesn't sound like there's any discussion. Um, so let's have a roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
You just did that because you're up for re-election. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, and now, uh, 1915, so that it passed unanimously. So uh, now, 1950, in order to expand Parsons Brook Greenway. Chair Perth. Okay. Second. OK, made and seconded. Any discussion on, on this <laughs> order? This is first reading. Uh, any uh, uh, questions about this? Actually, yeah. It, yeah. It, would you mind reading it into the record? Yeah. Yeah, should do that. And do we have anyone from the administration who wants to talk about it after? Would yeah, you? Mr. Okay. Fine couldn't be here tonight, but I can certainly talk about it. That would be good. Um, it's essentially, as Councilor Labarge will know this, um, there's um, two sort of access, what were, what had been planned for potential access um, roads. Uh, if you pull up the map just slightly, um, um, you'll see that um, off of two residential streets, there's like a narrow strip that's been um, reserved for access. And that was basically to support um, potential future development of the land that's in the middle, um, which we have now acquired as conservation land. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer developable property. Um, so what we're really doing is just cleaning this up and then adding these two parcels to conservation land since they're no longer needed for access to development. Um, they were to be, if we were going to extend the street or create a new subdivision um, in that area, um, it was going to provide the access. So that's how those other subdivisions were laid out and they were required to, to create these. So it's really just now going back and cleaning up. You'll see they're just little sliver parcels um, and they'll be you know, part of the uh, Parsons Brook Greenway uh, Pines Barrens uh, Barons for conservation and passive recreation purposes. Yeah, which so, is part of the, yeah. the, um, the, uh, the Willard the Gravel. The Willard yeah. Gravel. The Gravel. Yeah. It's, the, it's the parcel that was acquired as part of that. Right. Okay. Great. That's you know more helpful than me reading it out loud, although at the request of counselor, I will read into the record, so I say the magic words, and if there's further discussion, we can have it. Um, so we are talking about 19150 in order to expand Parsons Brook Greenway. Uh, ordered that, this is on the recognition of the mayor, planning and sustainability, and the conservation commission. Uh, ordered that whereas the open space and recreation plan 2018 to 2025 recommends preserving land and connections at the 118 acre Parsons Brook Greenway Pine Barrens, and whereas the developers of Sovereign Way and Cardinal Way donated two thin strips of property to potentially allow a road to be built from Sovereign Way to Cardinal Way. Uh, if you're interested, map ID 336, 334, uh, give or take 0.55 acres, and map ID 36293. Uh, give or take 0.4 acres. And whereas with the preservation of the Greenway, the road will never be built and the thin strips of land are only going to be used for access to the Greenway. So ordered that the mayor is authorized to transfer the care and custody of those two strips to the Conservation Commission uh, to add to the Parsons Brook Greenway Pine Barrens for conservation and passive recreation purposes provided by Master Law Chapter 40, Section 8C, subject, however, to the city reserving the rights to use the land for underground city utilities. All right. So now, further questions or discussion on this one? Seems like a good proposal. So, oh, Councilor Klein. I just have a quick question about the concept of access. Will it actually be maintained on an ongoing basis with a Road or a path, or is it just a I green think, space? I think that it's a green space. Yeah, I don't believe there's any uh, plans for a path. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. No further discussion? All right, sounds like we all understand it and can vote on first reading. So I'll ask for a roll. Yes. Councilor Ash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. And Councilor Labarge. Yes. OK, that's approved on first reading. Um, there are two ordinances that need to be referred somewhere before we vote. Uh, they at least need to go to legislative matters. Uh, we'll take them separately. First, 19153, Northampton Safe City Ordinance. Um, so here, motion to, approve, uh, to refer this to legislative we'll matters. Refer to legislative matters? Second. Second. I'll take it by Councilor Dwight. Any other referrals to other committees or anything? Or discuss, I mean, it's also in order to discuss if you, if you want or want to make it up to the council. So, but at a minimum, the legislative matters. But if there's anything else, just check. Okay. So nothing, just one committee? Okay. Okay. 
Uh, so, any discussion on the referral? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of referring it to committee, uh, say aye. 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 There was any abstention, so it is referred. Next, 19155, an ordinance to delete reference to the depot lot from section 312-110. Motion to refer to legislative matters. So moved. By Councilor Dwight, yes. second by Councilor Bidwell. Um, any discussion, or does it go anywhere else? Transportation parking? We could send it there. I think that um, at this point we'd be, you know, that this change has already happened, and um, so it might slow. Th I'd leave it up to my colleagues to figure out whether they want to send it there. I'm fine with it going to the TPC if needed. Is there a reason that? And this is like we, we this is like an even, this is like an, an ancient one. Like it used to be right. the depot restaurant, mm -hmm. and we've. Uh, and then it changed to Union Station. So we found this artifact of a reference to depot lot, which is like old um, from the 80s. And so we were, just, as we were searching and cross referencing, we were like, oh my gosh, we found this reference to something that hasn't been called. So we're basically just deleting the reference to depot. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, I don't know that it's going to be not very substantive. Um, yeah. So whatever you prefer. It's part of the other ones that have been, you know, well, you'll have one tonight, and then we discovered yet another one, and so, and this was like, we hope is the last one. So it's the gift that keeps on giving, keep finding. Okay, so I'm hearing just legislative matters. Yep. So that's what I'm hearing. Okay, so motion on the floor, is that correct? Do we have that? Yeah. So any discussion on the motion to refer? Uh, then all those in favor of will say aye. 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 There's any abstention, so it's referred. Um, so now we have actual ordinances to vote on, vote on. Uh, the first is 19114, an ordinance relative to stop signs on Fulton Avenue. Um, all right. So traffic ordinances are fun Second. because they're hard to describe. Although maybe not. That's why we have Councilor Nash. It's, if it's any consolation, you've, you've actually already read this into the record once before, but I don't know. I read this into the record. <coughs> well, well, I think for referral, I didn't. Well, I know we did. Well, no, I'm not. I can't be positive of that. So, okay. Uh, but now we're about to debate it. So anyway, we'll take Councilor Dwyer. You make a motion, maybe it's for approval. Yeah, it's so, so moved. Okay. And seconded by second Councilor Klein and Councilor. Uh, so uh, discussion on this, please. We defer to the chair of GPC to start. Uh, sure. Um, so. Uh, the reason this was read into the record before had to do with that we permitted a temporary installation to um, to allow a permanent installation that had already happened of stop signs on Fulton. Um, it was council asserting its right over the installation of stop signs. So this is so we have, we already voted on that temporary. Uh, installation. This is for the permanent installation, and it's come from the TPC with a positive recommendation. Okay. And I mean, I remember one of the reasons why we wanted to go to TPC is because you were discussing broader issues in that in that yeah, area, and, and then you were and, talking and about. So I, I, I can speak to some of that. Uh, that uh, that. So first of all, that the um, the police are going to continue to be on Fulton into the near future, and uh, part of the 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 question that came up uh, in my mind had to do with why are we installing stop signs now, while we have uh, the police still there, and there's discussion for future uh, possible redesign of you know where the parking might go on Pleasant Street or Con Street. Um, well, one of the answers was that, you know, discussion reveals things. It's great that the police aren't there all night. So that during the hours that they aren't there, it's, it's, it's uh, very helpful to have these stop signs to help direct the traffic as to where they're going to go. And that as far as the long-term plans, um, those things are still up in the air. And that um, if we change plans, that we will change uh, the ordinance with these signs, so. Okay. Any other discussion from the council? All right. I think there are related issues here, but they're not really on the agenda tonight. So, mm -hmm. as regards to the stop signs, so there you have it. Uh, if there's no other discussion, we need a roll call. 
First reading, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Carr. Yes. Yes. Okay, that is approved on first reading. So now. 19125, an ordinance related to wireless wireless an antennas on street. Uh, what's the next word going to be? I bet it's going to be poles. That's it. It is poles. Poles. Uh, this is the first reading on this. So. Okay. Second. All right. Thank you. So I see two versions of it. Yes. Maybe the chair of Legislative Matters knows why. And, and actually, Carolyn's here too as well. But we. Uh, the one thing that we just in the process of the discussion that we wanted to amend was the height by which the these systems would be placed on a pole. It was originally proposed at seven feet. Um, speaking as someone of six foot five and someone who or anyone else who might be driving a truck or vehicle or anything else, if these things had project beyond. Uh, a foot or two from the pole, they could actually create a hazard for any vehicle pulling in. And Carolyn was kind enough to draft some language based on our discussion. Uh, we felt it was appropriate to move it forward as it was, and then we could amend it on the floor here based on the language she's proposing, which now sets the height at nine feet instead of seven, and actually a critical language, and not project into the street. So. Excuse me, go ahead. Lynn. No, that's it. So the committee passed the original version out, did not amend in the committee. So we have to we, do that. Too. Right, with the understanding that we would amend on the floor. Okay. All right. So let's see. So therefore, we're dealing with the original unamended version. Uh, I could read it out loud, or I could, we could waive the reading and we could just, it's a public document. Paul can read it and we could just explain it. Maybe our senior land use planner could help with that process. That, it's a council's pleasure. Accessible to the that conversations. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Mish, would you mind or um, we'd welcome your help. Um, so this ordinance was um, proposed as a way to sort of catch up to technology that's coming upon us. We've had ordinances, um, zoning ordinances that um, since the late 90s, I want to say, that address telecommunication systems on what we call monopoles, which are very tall um, pole structures on private property. And as the technology changes, these um, systems get smaller and um, uh, the need for more and faster data all the time. <laughs> is um, triggering um, these, this newer technology where the, the um, antennas are placed closer together, lower to the ground, um, and, and for the most part, um, the um, uh, communication providers are interested in locating them in the street right away. So we don't really have any language now that specifically addresses that. We currently require special permits for any new pole that's installed, so that would trigger a new pole in the right of way on top of what city council would also have to approve as a new pole in the right of way. So this um, tries to address those um, that gap and be ready for this you know, next wave of installations for this technology. Uh, so there are two pieces of it. Um, one is to um, sort of identify these as small cell systems because they're, into, they're, they're meant to be closer together and have a, a shorter reach, essentially, with the um, radio frequency. And um, then identifies that there would be a fee established for the installation of each of these paid to the city. Uh, that was proposed as $400 per pole. Um, <clears throat> and that the providers would be solely responsible for the maintenance of that equipment. Um, and then it establishes um, the height. So that's not in zoning, that's just separate. And then in the zoning portion, it establishes a, um, a review process, but an administrative review process, because the city actually can't technically deny the installation of these um, telecommunication um, antennas 
based on FCC regulations. Um, so currently we have a special permit process or site plan process in front of the planning board that tends to set up this um, false sense for the public that if they come and weigh in on their dislike of the system or their concerns about um, safety or um, environmental or health impacts that some of these, that their concerns out there that people have, um, that the board can just deny them. And the board really can't deny them based on that because the federal government has sort of superseded that and said, you know, we have to approve these. So this um, ordinance also sets up an administrative review, but it says specifically what has to be done, what things have to be met. And so this height, um, minimum nine feet, and that um, only the antenna and the cable supporting that, as well as an emergency shutoff, mm -hmm. um, can be mounted on the pole. Any other equipment has to be put in a vault underground. So that's the, the bulk of the, the two ordinances that are in front of you. Thank you. And so, um, so if someone comes, they meet the criteria, they get the permit. And is that, and, and we'll go to Council Joy. And then, um, so we're operating under, as you said, FCC regulations. Um, what else are we um, operating under? Is there any state law that kind of sets any ground rules for us? Just curiosity. No? OK. So how much latitude do we have generally? When we charge $400 a pop, um, could we charge 800 I don't suggest we do, but can we? So there has to be a relationship to the fee. Because it's a fee. Right, right, right. OK. What it would cover. Right, right, okay. I know that the city of Boston has been doing this for a few years. They're charging $2,500 per poll um, for their polls that they own in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I, I think certainly they could be, that anybody in the FCC has, I think, made this clear that. Um, this can be challenged if it's if it appears to be sort of beyond what would be necessary as a fee that's related to the impact. Sure. Like like all fees, I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe that was thank you, and that was helpful. But I probably asked an un, unhelp I gave an unhelpful example in my question. So if, what if we wanted to, for example, um, <coughs> if that fee can be waived if they provide free internet. Um, and so could we, in theory, have a program where we provide or require them as part of their permit to provide free internet to, say, people based on income as part of their permit process? Don't worry, it's not going to hold up my vote. But I'm just curious. I want to, I want to understand our latitude. If, if we're not operating under any state restrictions, how, you know, what, what, how far can we go? And have you considered stuff like that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've studied this issue a little bit. I mean, we're, okay. this has sort of been um, the Trump FCC has sort of railroaded this through a little bit and sort of taken away local rights. It's been somewhat controversial mm -hmm. um, and basically have given us a very short window by which we have any regulatory review. Mm -hmm. um, it's like 90 days. Mm -hmm. So basically we have 90 days to do, to do something on it, but we really can't say no. Um, I would be very doubtful that we could demand that. I mean, because all we're we're not actually granting we're granting them construction rights in the public way, um, and these are like repeater antennas. Um, I I would be very doubtful that that would be allowed or hold up or hold up to FCC scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my opinion. Okay. Um, Verizon currently doesn't offer, um, uh, you know, DSL or internet service. They're not a, they're not a provider. So I'm not sure how that would work. Because um, these aren't Wi-Fi you know, hives. They're not, so I'm not really sure how that would work. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And, so, then, and then I'll turn it over to the other counselors because I've monopolized the floor. But you know, if, so are you saying that we have 90 days to pass a ordinance, and then after that, we're sort of like out of luck? You want to explain the shot yeah. <laughs> 90 days, so, so once, let's say, Verizon comes in and says, I want to put my system on, this, on these three poles. We have 90 days. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. that's what it means. Like I not see. 90 days past an order. I thought you were saying the FCC gave yeah. local communities like. No, 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 no. 
No, they just. Although that might not be surprising. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is a policy decided by tweet at three in the morning. It's like we can't have a ten-month review process, and we can't forward it to every committee, and we can't have you know three months of public hearings and those. I kinds see. Of things. Yeah, that's the that's what it really is. So that's part of why we're trying to create a somewhat compact process so that we at least have some way to to regulate it. Okay. Thank you. So my colleague, Councilor Large, has been waiting. Um, actually, it was to this point that the, some conversation was had in legislative matters. We still referred it with a positive recommendation. It's worth noting, though, the frustration of essentially a non-representative body, an agency that is not elected but appointed, has actually can supersede and direct communities to do its bidding. Um, you, you actually, this happens with the FAA with drones, for instance, same, same thing. They dictate that now public airspace is now six inches off the ground, or it used to be 500 feet. The, um, it's frustrating, uh, particularly with this government. Um, the fact is that <laughs> we're given this slight semblance of control and management insofar as that we can dictate how high up the pole it can go, it can't project out over cars, and um, beyond that we can't manage the ubiquity. We can adjust the fees. I have a feeling Boston's going to get nailed on that $2,500 poll thing eventually. I think someone's, I think Verizon or somebody's going to turn around and sue them because it's we noted you have to justify a fee and a $2,500 per poll administrative cost fee. I think that's a stretch, even for Boston. So we, we certainly can. And so it is maddening. It is frustrating. It is just part of a large catalog of frustrations. But this is, I, I, I've been thinking for, for weeks since our conversation about what can we do in some, in some way to give us so, ourselves more agency here. And it's not there, and it's not there. So, insofar as I, I've heard, we've heard from a number of people who are concerned about RF impacts on or uh, potential for health issues, um, also the the unsightliness of the poles. Council Murphy was actually kind enough to share with us some photographs of a pole on Elm Street near Smith. Um, of one of the units. The units are all different. If you look, if you just do an image search for, uh, you know, uh, 5G antennas on poles, they they look like they look like essentially the assortment of droids you can see in a Star Wars film. It's a variety. They're all completely different. Looks like they were cobbled together by someone high on airplane glue or something. But it was like the cantina scene. <laughs> yes, exactly the cantina scene. And so with a bus station in total recall. So we can't dictate aesthetics. We can't dictate. Um, uh, there, there are limits that are established under federal law for RF transmissions, radio frequency transmissions. But the fact is, is that none of these have been vetted or peer reviewed to the point to the extent that the uh, health impact is realized or understood. But it's the Trump administration and his FCC who is intent on, on making fast uh, tracking all these systems so that uh, they will provide uh, greater download speeds so you can look at your cat pictures much quicker on your phone. Actually gave it a, an acronym called the FAST plan, the FAA. Wow, that was yeah, clever, yeah. almost yeah. like the USA Patriot Act. America's app. superiority in 5G technology, the FAST plan. <laughs> That's what the FCC, FCC uh, I'm having these new regulations. I'm having a so. problem holding down my dinner, so I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that then. But so, so we, we did forward it with a recommendation, being fully aware of our, our, our very limited op, uh, uh, chance to say no. Thank you very much. So, Councilor Nash. Yeah, do we know why they have emergency shutoffs? I'm just, uh, you know, it dawned on me now. We don't have that for cable on the poles or for telephone, but each one of these devices has emergency shutoff, and why is that? Well, I would say because cable and phone are low voltage, so right. it's probably not uh, an issue, but these obviously are powered up. So, you know, if they have to work on it, they have to have a way to work to shut it off. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, there's, if you go to the FCC, if you go to the FCC website about their fast plan, it's quite remarkable that you know we've, you know, they basically have um, 
you know, new rules that will reduce federal regulatory impediments and, uh, and speeding up state and local review of small cells. The FCC reformed rules designed decades ago to accommodate small cells. The reforms ban short-sighted municipal roadblocks that have the effect of prohibiting deployment of 5G um, and give them a reasonable deadline to approve or disapprove small cell siting applications. So, 90 days. Did you get the sarcastic tone for the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that read back to you. <laughs> Restoring internet freedom and all okay. kinds of other wonderful things. I see. Yeah. The counselor for Ward 7. Uh, I just want to say for the record that I, um, I have a lot of concern about um, the advent of 5G just in terms of uh, what has already been discussed here. Um, potential health impacts, we just don't have enough research, we don't know enough about it. Um, these are really unsightly boxes and thank you Councillor Murphy for sending those photos around because it, it really did show how um, incredibly unsightly they are. In legislative matters, we talked about the height in terms of the aesthetics and the safety, but there is also uh, safety in terms of, you know, tall people, tall trucks, but I think um, having them as high up as we can um, potentially could cut some of the potential harmful impact. Um, and the only reason that I sent this forward, uh, my vote, on legislative matters is because of this conundrum that we have to do this within a three month period or essentially it's taken out of our hands completely. Um, but I, I did want to say for the record that I'm pretty concerned about this and uh, uh, very frustrated by the fact that this FAST plan, I didn't realize it was called that, comes from um, you know corporate lobby pressure big money on uh, our legislators and uh, our president and the FCC and that is um, you know deeply concerning thank you Can I ask a question though because now I'm confused do we have 90 days to pass this ordinance or no no no, 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 no. so when, but when you say that's what I thought so when you say we have to do this the, what do you the boxes will be installed anyway at least we have the birth to you know set some limits about what it's going to look like that some of it's going to be underground okay. all of those pieces and that Got we it. get to set a fee. Got it. Because otherwise we wouldn't in fact um, receive any remuneration for the Got it. the installation of these okay. if we didn't actually pass this ordinance. So thank you. So as a practical matter, the companies are putting them in like soon. No. Basically true. So the picture I took was, was of one being installed as we speak. Okay. That's pretty soon. We've already had four total approved. Um, have, have we really? Okay. Like Got it. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Oh, Councilor Murphy. Um, yeah. I, I'd actually like to offer a couple amendments to this because I thought more things were going to get thought about than just the height of the pole. Um, the first one is in the new definition of small cell telecommunications. Um, where it talks near the end for the purposes of providing 5G wireless telecommunications. I would just strike the 5G because, in fact, the four that are now being installed are 4, 4G infill, right. not 5G. So it probably makes sense not to put in a designation of exactly what it is. It's a small cell. If you get 4, 5, 12, whatever it is, it, just call it for the purposes of wireless tele telecommunications and, and take that out of there. Do, do it one at a time? Um, sure. I'll, I'll Just because it's that. messy, so. I'll second that amendment. There's a motion. I hear it seconded. Any discussion? Removing 5G just from one place? That's the only place it's mentioned like that. Okay. So if there's no more discussion on the amendment, all those in favor of the amendment removing 5G, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And uh, the, the other one. Uh, the other ones are in the paragraph, paragraph one, the following page. The first one is uh, wireless small cell telecommunications applicants must include radio frequency analysis to demonstrate the proposed equipment will have the smallest number of pole attachments necessary. Really, radio frequency anal analysis has nothing to do with that. If you want that in there, just say to include analysis to demonstrate the proposed equipment will have the smallest number of pole attachments since it really isn't a radio frequency analysis. It's more our analysis of how much junk they want to hang on the poles. But it really doesn't affect the radio frequency. OK. 
Okay. Um, I'll, I'll second for purposes of discussion. All right. So, so just deleting the words radio frequency? Yeah. So it's, it's still requests the analysis. We don't define it as radio frequency analysis because that really isn't appropriate. We're analyzing the junk on a pole, not the radio frequency of the gear on the pole, which is regulated already. I mean, it's going to be on a certain frequency that it's assigned. Okay. So it's radio frequency analysis is capitalized. It's a thing, <laughs> right? Like it's a thing? Is, is it yeah. is a reason why it was put in? or? Yeah. So... Um, um, The, the idea is, that, so even now under the current rules, uh, radio frequency is, is required to sh show that there's demonstrated need, that there's a gap that's being filled. And so by, so if you have a lot of overlapping RF um, um, coverage, then that means that you've got more poles than maybe is necessary. So the idea is to say, you know, it um, requests this, the fewer, fewest um, possible pole installations to obtain that coverage. Um, and I think the idea is, um, so I'm just going to make sure. Um, so um, I guess pole attachments, meaning if the poles are already there for the most part, so maybe you don't need the attachment on every single pole, maybe you can do every other pole. So um, I think it would be beneficial to maintain the language that we still want to evaluate the radio frequency um, reports that come. Uh, just very briefly, and then we'll go to Councilor Dwight. Another idea would be, you just say and. You could say radio frequency analysis and demonstrate. Yes. Think about that, but Councilor Dwight. Uh, well, that's, that's not terrible. I mean, the... Thank you. Part of this conversation, I, we had this conversation as well, is because um, there are a series of competing agencies. Currently now on the taller poles, we actually have mandated and do mandate that um, competing systems combine their property on the pole, on one pole. We're not going to have, uh, have the town bristling with these tall uh, towers. And that we were allowed to do. The FCC didn't bark us down on that one. In this instance, you have competing systems that will be having generating each unit generates its own RF frequency. And to Carolyn's point, the overlap and the density of multiple machines in one pole uh, could create a higher intensity of radio frequency transmissions that you wouldn't otherwise expect if it were just literally one per pole. We could have applicants, you know, we could have poles with Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, whomever, uh, you know, the Google Towers, <clears throat> at which point you have all these machines emanating a radio frequency that's approved by the FCC, but there's a concentration of RF uh, transmissions that would, I think, to this point, we should say that you have to keep it within the limits of, of, uh, of, of acceptable norms. So, Councilor Murphy, oh. and then Councilor Klein. Well, I, I, I mean, I understand the intent, but the sentence doesn't say that. If your desire is to do a radio frequency analysis to demonstrate that we have the fewest number of small cell installations in the city to cover, that is correct. But to say radio frequency analysis to demonstrate that the proposed equipment will have the smallest number of pole attachments is just a wacky statement. In other words, we don't want any more small cells than we need to cover the city. So we radio frequency analysis to make sure we don't have excessive small cells to get the job done is appropriate. To say we're doing the analysis to limit the amount of equipment on any given pole is absurd. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Nope, yeah. I, yeah. I hear you. So the, the concept behind it is fine to make sure that we don't have more of these things than we need in the city. But I actually don't think it's referring to attachments on a single pole, I think it means pole attachments, meaning spread out across spread the out. city, which Sounds is what you said, which is what... Right. So it's it's the smallest number of these small cell systems, Yeah. not equipment on a particular pole, but yeah. the smallest number of total small cells to cover the city adequately. I mean, the sentence needs to be a lot clearer than what it is. Um, and that, you know, I'm not saying 
we don't want to accomplish the goal of having the fewest number of small cells possible to get the job done, but it's just not written technically correct to deal with that. And it's a relatively easy fix. Mm. Councilor Klein? <clears throat> I realize my comment is not to the amendments. So I'll wait until we finish this. <clears throat> Actually, do not have an amendment on the floor, but yeah, no, that probably is. Actually, we do for purposes of discussion. I did second, so there is. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah, we do. I stand correct. Um, so, all right. Anyone and else want to weigh? You have more to say? And then Councilor. Actually, Councilor Bill hasn't spoken. Oh, well, I do understand this distinction. Mm -hmm. And aren't, aren't you in position now to propose some slightly altered language? Well, I can certainly try to do that. I mean, uh, I thought I saw you. Oh, I've, 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 been, I've been writing on it. I was more interested in making my point in, an, okay. in a comprehensible <laughs> manner than actually coming up the lamp. Uh, you certainly could say something like radio frequency analysis to demonstrate um, that the smallest number of small cell sites will be installed to serve the city. I mean, the, the language is hard to do like on the spot here, but I do think we need to correct the language to reflect the true intent of what we're saying. No more small cells are necessary to get the job done. It doesn't relate to equipment on, because this could be implied to be um, pole attachments on a pole, not necessarily the number of total number of these things. Um, it could be clearer than it is. So so what we need is we, we need counselors to confer with um, ec experts, even if they are experts themselves, and bring actual language that has been uh, vetted to the next council meeting. I mean, I really, because I've got one more of these, which I'm happy to mention, but it may make more sense just to refer this back to committee to get the language right and bring it back, bring it back and deal with it later. Because this is, it's a matter of bad language. It isn't a matter. I don't think of us agreeing what we're trying to do. It's just writing it correctly so that it. Yeah. You know. Alternatively, we could bring it to the second reading as well. This is your first reading, right? This is for. Did this come up in legislative matters? No. Did not. Okay. No. Do you want to skip to your third one and then come back? Well, I can certainly bring up, the, I mean, this one's on the floor, but if you don't mind, I'll do the third one just to see what it is. My and, guess. and the third one did come up, and at, we talked about it legislative matters. All equipment other than antennas, wires, um, and emergency shutoffs shall be placed in an underground vault. Um, the power supplies are really not conducive to being buried in the ground. Um, I gave you a picture when it's all covered with heat sinks. It needs air to ventilate it. It gets hot. So burying it in the ground, I don't know where that came from, but uh, it's a really, really bad idea for the electronics. And when I was taking the pictures of the pole, the, both of the nice guys there that were installing it said, what lunatic would want to bury this in the ground? It's going to cook because <laughs> it needs to breathe. And it's not that big a thing. I mean, the boxes that cable hangs on the poles for the telephone <coughs> system are gigantic. These things are not things like about like this. And That's if you see it on the pole, the pole I gave you the picture of has the shutoff, the power supply mm -hmm. and the antenna, they're all on the pole. And it isn't really, you know, there's bigger things on poles now than these things. They really aren't conducive to being buried in a hole in the ground. Um, so, I, you know, that I, I don't agree with at all because that's going to cause a real hairball for the people trying to apply for these things because they're not going to want to do that. And uh, where did that come from? Um, it's a, it's an, it came from wanting to minimize the impact to the view shed and the aesthetics of the whole by continuing to add equipment. There are communities in, around the country that are requiring this. Um, Washington, D.C. has a requirement that um, the equipment be underground. There are other systems um, that are actually designed to be entirely underground, with nothing above the ground, ground um, including the antennas. Um, so we felt like it was important to, to, um, to uh, you know, we need to allow these, but we want to have the least impact on the community, on the streetscape as, as we can. So did, that's why it was Did anyone ever speak to the engineers putting these in about pairing them in the before we pick this up? I think one of the original, I think one of the original versions of the ordinance, there was, there was a discretion. There was sort of like, they had to strive to the right. area. But the, the city solicitor didn't feel comfortable with that, and because it was, it just wasn't really a, um, wasn't really a process, and especially like having a staff member be in charge of that, um, just 
it was too subjective and um, so that I think the city solicitor really insisted that it has to be one or the other it can't be um, you know it can't be, you know it can't be like to the full extent possible try but we may not let you kind of a thing because that would be a, a strange process for somebody to go through but I mean that's that's a legal process but anybody ever talked to any of these vendors about is this thing conducive to be there there, you talk, there are systems that do go underground like the, the antenna goes underground like everything goes up. Like right. you don't actually have to be on a pole like that. Right. But the, yeah. the ones that are underground tend to be in large utility conduits with yeah. ventilation and, and all kinds of stuff, system. not exactly. not a hole in the ground at the <coughs> pole. Exactly. Which is the, the this is our power source, not the not yeah. the antenna structure. No, yeah. 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 I mean we have my next door neighbor has an underground power source and I mean, and runs their power to their house underground. Yeah. yeah. It's all the but this is a little power supply box that gets hot, which is why it's covered with heat sinks. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I'd just like to perhaps. Well, if you if you'd like, we can consult with someone about it and just get some information about it for second reading, and then we can, you know, because but I think the way the process is set up, um, it, it, we sort of have to pick one. We can't say that's the challenge. So yeah. And I, I think just sort of long term, looking at the the build out of this, and um, and the technology is going to change. I, I think I, I wouldn't disagree with you. To, um, in terms of um, the pushback that we might get from these providers, because the easiest, simplest thing is just to throw up a pole, throw up the equipment, and walk away. Mm -hmm. But um, knowing that we're going to have lots of these coming, that starts to add up and, and um, changes the landscape. So we want to minimize. We're like starting to be having like a bunch of Fijians around a pot with a Verizon guy in there arguing about whether we're putting carrots or parsnips in one of them. I mean, we really don't have the answers to these questions, but we want to move it along anyway because we're compelled to do that without really getting the answers to the questions. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, the other thing I'd suggest is if you're insisting we put these things in holes in the ground, they probably should be permitted, this should be permitted by DPW who controls the right of way and controls digging holes in the ground rather than planning and development. Because you guys don't have anything to do with digging holes in the ground in the right of way. So. That's interesting. Um, so if I may, I think, I think it's interesting. I feel sort of like I'm designing a space shuttle and I, I don't know what I'm doing, which scares me. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm at least one of the biggest nerds in this room. So um, if I'm uncomfortable, you know, I, I, you know, I think that um, here are our options, perhaps. Three, op three suggestions. So this can go back to legislative matters, which I believe doesn't meet till November. You can go to city services, which is would be in the jurisdiction of the committee. Uh, for a fresh perspective. We can vote on it tonight and make sure we do the work that we have to do to get these questions answered, because if we have questions, we have to answer them and get them answered, and then bring hard language. In fact, it would be nice to submit the language not in a way that violates the open meeting law, but in a way that submits it to the council and the public for review ahead of time and to the planning department. And vote on it tonight and come back, or we can continue. So actually, you have four choices. Councilor Klein. Um, I do think that this discussion of the amendments really has brought to light um, our lack of knowledge around the technical aspects of this. So I, that's what I wanted to say before you um, articulated it. I hope I didn't jump in front of you. Sorry. No, it's yeah, okay. totally fine. Um, and I don't know if we're still speaking to the amendment, but just to add to this conversation about our lack of technical expertise here, one of the things I'm thinking about is we've now made a recommendation that we're, we move these up by another two feet. And I'm wondering if there's potential for that, meaning that there will need to be um, more of them because it's higher and we're trying to provide coverage. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, you can shake your head now here on the floor, but I just think that there are enough technical questions here and we're kind of coming up with simple solutions of how to change the language that this really needs to go back to the drawing board on some level. And I'm not sure that sending it to one of the city council committees makes the most sense because we don't have that technical expertise. Um, and I think the last point that Councillor Murphy brought up is really important <coughs> about uh, the right of way and who, you know, if we're digging holes in the ground, um, who has jurisdiction over that. So I just think there are enough um, technical questions and there are enough kind of procedural questions <coughs> here that we need to, to get something a little bit more um, sound before we vote on it. Okay, um, process, if it goes to a committee, well, obviously, what we do is we bring in we bring in the experts to us. So whether it's the DPW or planning or all of the above, 
that's what we would <coughs> rather than just decide it ourselves in, in committee. But I take your point. So we're going to go. Actually, Councillor Carney has not spoken, so I like just to, to that point of, de of deferring yeah. to an additional committee. My sense is it would make better sense going to the original legislative matters for more in depth rather than bringing the folks from city services, you know, a further up to speed on the technicalities. <coughs> so whether that means holding an additional legislative matters or something else, rather, and plus our not. November 7th, city services is jam packed with um, hearings for public street acceptance and another presentation from senior services. That I don't think that would make sense. Point well taken, Councilor Murphy. And uh, legislative matters meets on the 11th? The 14th. The 14th. Yeah. All right. All right, so it would still come back for our second meeting in on November. So it would be done, theoretically done for the second meeting. And I mean, what we're doing is more like committee work anyways, no, rather than council work. No, it's, the it's the 12th, it's the 12th. The 12th, yes. So it would come back for our second meeting in November. Okay, let's dispense with this. All I know is we're not gonna vote on it tonight. So I open up to the council, someone make a motion to send it somewhere or delay it. There's a motion currently on the floor. <laughs> there, there is, but this would be a subsidiary motion that took, no, no, no. Good point. So what we could do for simplicity is, is have the motion withdrawn if that were. I withdraw my second. Second? Yep, that's fine. And I would okay. move we send it back to legislative matters for further consideration. Is there a second to that second. motion? Second. Okay. Discussion on the referral, <clears throat> Councilor uh, um, Dwight. Just, just a brief comment. It's, I'm just disappointed that these questions didn't come up during the first legislative matter. I understand that. Council Murphy was able to get some new information uh, um, at the time, but it would be it would have been a little more timely if we, we if this were introduced at the first legislative matter time. But and, and in fact, although regardless, we wouldn't have had the answers there anyway. But um, so so I, I, I look forward to a a, uh, a more expansive conversation in the next one. And the people who can answer these questions have to be invited to the meeting. It goes without saying, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so I don't know who that is, but we'll find them. Well, that's there. There's the rub. <laughs> <laughs> there's the rub. Right. So we're done acting like Hamlet because we've made, made a decision. So, Councillor Klein. Um, I just wanted to go back to the mayor and Ms. Mish and um, ask them though if they feel like they want to take another crack at this. I mean, I, I'm not totally comfortable with legislative matters pulling this apart just because of the level of technical questions that we have. So I'm wondering if that could be an alternative. Yeah. I mean, we can certainly try to, I mean, again, we try to bring answers to questions that we had. Um, really not much that matters, but, um, there just needs to be research. Washington, D.C. has required to be a Obviously, say this is bad it's going to overheat they're not going to like that they're going to want it to be above ground so it's a, it's partially a mistake so we but we can definitely try to get more uh details on this on the scientific parts of it all right is it safe to be underground is it unsafe to be underground etc it is definitely more money to bury things underground there's no doubt about it it's always going to cost more money um but again it's also what limited control we have whether you know we want whether that's a good thing or a bad thing but we'll do some research on it but if you want us to come to legislative matters we can um i'm not sure who we can bring in i mean i'm sure we can bring verizon in and i'm sure they'll tell you that you know that this would be a the end of times if they had to bury these things yeah. and we put them out of business and you know we could go back to um you know crank telephones i'm pretty sure that's what they'll tell you but i but you know we can do some research on it I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, if push came to shove, the, we would hear from the FCC that we were serving in our little podunk way as an yeah. impediment to the advancement of... Uh, it's possible, but we yeah. can certainly do some research, research on it. And then the question of the DPW, I mean, <coughs> the, um, as you know, a lot of uh, most uh, planning applications go to DPW, um, and so this would be routed to DPW. I mean, I can ask DPW if they have a burning desire to take this on. Um, I doubt that this is, I don't think they're dying to take on more uh, licensing um, issues. Um, and so I think it just came out as planning because it was um, 
you know, they were the ones developing the regulations. They were, they were trying to make it the least um, burdensome. And so, certainly. And there's really no discretion. I mean, that's the other piece of this, is that um, you know, Alan was pretty clear that, you know, unless you're going to give it to the planning board um, or some other body, um, <coughs> that it really needs to be really clear guidelines and it's like a really clear approval process. So, we can have the, we can have the solicitor look at it, we can have DPW look at it. Um, while we're requesting information, <laughs> uh, some information relative to what these vaults look like, yep. dimensions, cost, uh, uh, and ventilation, other systems, what they look like, uh, mm -hmm. would, if the cost would be considered prohibitive, whatever, but any dimensional sizes. I mean, a vault is any number of things. It could be a massive crypt or it could be a box about the size of this, yep. uh, of this transformer. So. And what they're made of. Sure. Like what we're putting into the ground. Right. We can definitely, I mean, there, there are lots of companies that are creating these underground vaults for all sorts and sizes of different right. um, infrastructure. So it's out there, the information's out there. I think I would just add in terms of the evaluation of which department is doing this, this is part of this, this is within the zoning ordinance. Right. Um, DPW doesn't generally um, enforce or review um, uh, licensing or permitting that's in the zoning ordinance. So that's another reason why um, I think it's set up this way that the planning, the director of planning sustainability um, is in charge of approving this. Is there an ordinance where if you want to dig anything, you need a permit from the DPW? Where does this cancel that one out? Trench permit. Trench permit. Do it. Yes. So the DPW would be reviewing it as yeah. a trench permit, but that would be, that's more of a construction requirement. Right. Yeah. Not an approval of <clears throat> construction. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, they would definitely have to, you know, so they'll be involved. You have to pay a trench permit fee, too, by the way. Just mm -hmm. put it in there. Oh. To Ching. <laughs> <laughs> put that in your underground vault with money. Um, so the, right, so the motion is currently to refer to legislative matters for further review. To the next meeting, whatever it may be, to give you flexibility. OK, good. So any more discussion? All those in favor of the referral? Well, wait a minute. When you when it gets there, please please adopt the uh, planning amendments as well. We're not yes. doing that. So, so, uh, so all those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed and abstention. So thank you. It's referred. Um, and by the way, that that was great. I actually really appreciate that attention to detail from multiple counselors on that. That's our job. So thank you. Um, now. We have six G by the time we finish this. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so 19128, an ordinance to amend Chapter 312 of the Code of Ordinances by amending 312110 uh, to delete reference to Union Station parking lot. First reading. Uh, move approval. Second. Or second. Second. Okay, made and second. Let's see what we got here. This is not the depot, this is, um, okay. So now we are deleting the off-street parking areas. Um, well, you know, it's sort of um, beautiful soup. Um, so maybe the mayor wants us to describe it in his own words. Okay. Or <coughs> Councilor Nash. Yeah, can you tweet it? <laughs> right. Um, is that what it is? So um, this is basically, um, as those you've read in the newspaper, I've come to TPC and to Legislative Matters. Um, this is to basically go back and remove the um, municipal parking um, controls that are on the um, leased spaces that we have, daytime leased spaces that we have in the Union Station lot. Um, we uh, uh, have contracted out for services to manage the parking in the lot. Um, some ways to try to unify the parking and make it more clear to people. Um, I think many people thought it was a city-owned lot. Um, it's actually not a city-owned lot. We have a 99-year lease um, for the daytime, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. use of a set number of spots down near Pleasant Street, not up near the train station, but down near Pleasant Street. Um, and um, we had been uh, using you know, our own city meters um, to regulate them. Um, as Union Station uh, became op operational again and had you know business uses or train uses, there was confusion about um, the parking and the delineation between at six o'clock when the whole lot reverts back to being a private lot 
um, and how they could manage it. Um, and so we had many um, years of discussion with the ownership of Union Station to try to figure out a way that we could um, manage it better together. And, um, and we landed on this idea of one of us managing it, managing the whole lot. Um, and so it ended up that we put out an RFP seeking uh, uh, contract services to manage it. Um, and so essentially what's happening is we still have our, you know, we still have these spaces at the front of the lot, which during the daytime, um, the pricing is at, you know, municipal pricing. Um, it can't be any higher than, um, than municipal pricing until six o'clock. Um, and then after that, again, it's, it's, a, um, it's a privately owned lot and they control it. Um, we did require a 15 minute free um, access to the lot. Um, and that's something that um, SDOT um, also um, wanted to see there, uh, just so that there could be easy pickup and drop off of passengers. Um, obviously, we don't have 15 minute free spots throughout the downtown, so that's not an uncommon um, time limit for people to drop off and pick off. Uh, it's not to, um, it's not designed to, it's really just designed for somebody who wants to drive in, drop someone off, and then come back and pick them up. Um, uh, and, um, so that's what it's, that's the way that this was structured. The owners of Union Station have invested in the, new, in the technology, the gate system technology, the kiosks. Um, they are validating parking for their own customers because obviously it's their lot. Um, and again, they're charging um, uh, what we charge um, garage and what we charge at the um, <coughs> Gothic Street um, uh, lot that is um, not as much as Main Street, which is a dollar, but um, they're, they are not allowed to go over that. So it's a three-year contract. Um, and so far, um, the management seems to be working quite well. Um, there was a little bit of a learning curve, um, but um, that's, that's, so all we're doing now is going back and just removing these from the books. Um, because they're no longer being enforced as municipal spaces. We don't have to enforce it. We don't have to, we don't give tickets. Um, you actually you know, couldn't get a ticket because of the way the gate system works. And then we collect revenue, guaranteed revenue. Whether anybody parks there or doesn't park there, we get a guaranteed revenue uh, based on um, you know, what uh, pricing they're using in the lot for our spots. So that's, the, that's the, the context in which I'm coming forward to say we want to remove these, um, these from the books because they're now sort of irrelevant. Right. Thank you. Okay. And Councilor Dwight. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> after, after lamenting that I didn't ask, uh, we didn't have these questions about the towers in LM, I forgot to ask, um, I'm assuming, but I don't know if this is true, uh, who's responsible for plowing or are we off? Oh, I thought there were city subcontractors who did plow it at one point, no? Okay. This is one of the greatest leases in the history of leases. <laughs> yeah. which, you know, the owners of uh, the owners of Union Station quickly found out when they bought the property. Um, it was a 99-year lease. Um, we actually, uh, it was then the depot rest. It was the owners of the depot basically, right. um, and and it was basically given to us in exchange for the city repaving the lot. So the city actually paid to repave right. the entire lot, and then in consideration of that, we were granted these municipal uh, spaces. Um, originally, they were dispersed out um, around the lot differently, but then there was an, am uh, an amended lease that came to the council back in the 90s, and we kind of consolidated them all next to Pleasant Street because that was more, you know, in keeping with uh, you know the, the corridor there. So yeah, it's. Um, they are required to do all the maintenance, all the plowing, all of everything. It's not, and again, it's private property. It's not all we literally have is the land uh, rights, um, similar to what we have in some ways with the um, Gothic Street deck right. on the police station. Still state land, still state lot. We have a lease to, to build our deck over the top of it, um, and we are allowed to use the the the, um, the lower deck area again. Mm -hmm outside of the hours of right. uh, after six o'clock yeah but it's state property and in that case we actually do maintain it but obviously there's not a lot of snow removal under the deck so any other questions comments councilor nash yeah i first of all i want to thank the mayor for 
fielding all of my questions over the last week. I, I because I've been trying to because I like many people, you know, walk by there for years thinking, oh, that's a public parking lot. Look at the meters and the whole thing. And um, that it's taken several passes to for me to fully get, you know, private property, the, the way that service contracts are negotiated by the mayor's office. Um, and that, um, that I, th you know, I think we've landed in a really good spot. Uh, that the city is no longer doing enforcement. Uh, we don't have to worry about any maintenance in the lot. Um, there's guaranteed revenue, and that you know, and that ultimately the the parking fees align with um, the the parking fees we charge uh, for our parking garage. So um, I mean, the, the, and that I think some people are upset because there was a lack of enforcement and oversight during um, uh, the times where the city wasn't providing the enforcement and that uh, there was a perception that the the lot was free parking and that um, and that I, I know for some people that has been a hardship uh, there's uh, people who live at live 155 um, that I'm I've been reaching out to wayfinders, find out where those people are parking now. There was, I don't know, five or six people that were parking there. And um, um, I'd like to, you know, investigate ways for that to, um, for them to find a place to park at night. Um, and that, you know, people were used to showing up and being able to sit and wait for trains. And um, that's no longer the case. But that also has to do that with the, this is private property. And they are now have a system in place that aligns with, you know, our our parking uh, system, and um, so I, I am supportive of this. Now that I finally understand it. <laughs> I, I tried to point out to people too that you know, if you go up and down the Vermont line, um, there's not free parking provided in Hartford. There's not free free parking provided in New Haven, there's not free parking provided at Penn Station, there's not free parking in Greenfield, there's not, you know, so um, this is not like we're not doing something radically that's different. And again, we don't even own a parking lot near the station. I mean, this was, this is their parking lot. So, um, so there, I just, I've always tried to just make sure people understand that in context. If you go to Union Station and you want to take a train somewhere overnight, I mean, you'd be smarter to go park at MGM. Um, but, but if you park at Union Station, I was just there for a, an event last week and you have to pay for parking so um yeah um we as you said we don't own a lot next to the station but we do own a garage very near the station and we it's our garage is slightly is 0.1 miles uh, farther than the union station lot is from the springfield station so right. it's very similar to exactly. many of the other yeah. train exactly yeah so and again i think um you know many people you know, airports have the, um, you know, cell phone lots and other, you know, ways that, you know, if your train's running late, you say, you know, come get, you know, it hasn't arrived yet. Um, I just dropped my daughter off at the train recently to go up to Burlington to visit a friend. And again, the train's running 20 minutes late. So you're going to, you know, maybe you're not going to go into the parking lot until you know that the train's going to pull in and then you pull up and pick them up. So, I mean, this is not an uncommon arrangement. Um, so. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I have one more thing I want to add is that we're not voting on the right uh, on, the, right. on the rates or anything exactly. like that. That that is a service contract. Decide, you know, the mayor handled that piece. That what we're doing is you know aligning our ordinance with you know what we expect our enforcement officers to oversee. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Any other uh, discussion on this ordinance? Uh, hearing none, we have it on the floor. Yeah. I sometimes lose track of these things. Uh, so, uh, Councilor Donald. Yes. Councilor Sharon. Yes. Councilor Danielle. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Okay, approved on first reading. Next, uh, 19140, an ordinance relative to parking on Arnold Avenue. Uh, motion to get this on the floor, please. Approve. To approve. All right, made and seconded. Um, this is one of those things best addressed with a map and a Jim Nash. I think. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, so, um, yeah, if we could get the map up. 
So what you there are four different ordinances here related to parking around Smith. They've been twice to the TPC, once where the TPC reviewed them and found them um, to send them forward with a positive recommendation, and the second time to provide the public, um, particularly people at Smith, to show up and speak to these. And um, when at uh, TPC the second time, um, we didn't have anybody show up, but we were hoping that somebody would be there with questions. Um, so I have to throw Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'll take over from You'll here. Take over? Oh, yeah. good. All right, thank you. Um, so anyway, the, uh, to summarize what's going on, uh, the first one has to do with Arnold Avenue, and uh, that uh, the, the um, prohibition of, on parking on the south side of Arnold will stay in place. On the north side, um, the parking will be better delineated. If you look at the, the one on top, you can see that the, uh, that the allowed parking area uh, goes all the way to the entrance to that parking lot. <coughs> if you just go back down on the screen, you can see that it delineates a parking zone that, um, so that people have visibility as they're uh, going from Arnold and, uh, into that parking lot there. Um, the zone, so also, of the four, within the four pack, uh, ordinances that were creating long-term parking, 10-hour parking um, that at 25 cents an hour, and also that people can park at these uh, spaces uh, with a permit that they can pick up at our parking office. Um, and so that's, that's the story here. So these will become 10-hour parking spaces on Arnold. I guess we have to take these. Should I just go through them all and then? Well, and yeah, I any would, questions about this one? I would actually, I would move them as a group. Yeah, I was going right, to guess that too. Is there a second? Uh, and that, and that, that would be, by the way, uh, just for the record, item 19.140, 141, 142, and 143. And so my motion is to move those those one two three four, four second. items. So seconded. that's been made and seconded. So take it from there. Do you want to take over? Can, um, so what are we doing? Uh, they've been taken as a group. The motion's been made and seconded to take them as a group. So All the, the four parking ordinances. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so that's so you've expanded the original motion. Yeah. You had one of them. Yes. I think it was a good one. Right. It hasn't been. Matches narrative. Up to 19143, uh, parking in West Street? Yes. Right. Correct. Um, anything We're interesting? Still talking about it. Oh. Any further discussion on any of them, I guess? Did, Council, do you want to hear about the others? Did yeah, you want to hear about the others? Oh, okay. Council, yeah, yeah, I want to keep talking about them. Oh, then. by all means. Okay. Yeah. Do we have to vote on taking them as a group, though? We did. Oh, okay. We don't have to vote. So it's just that's the motion. We made the motion. We didn't. Oh, I got it. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> any more questions about Arnold? No. Put your fishes. Okay. Let's go Belmont. to Belmont. Let me get a. Okay. So again, uh, it's it's much the same here that we're cleaning up. Uh, if you look at on the left here, uh, that uh, we it was you know it's currently on street parking, uh, no meters. You see a green spot there for some short term parking. Um, that the the new ordinance uh, cleans things up, lines up around where the parking can start and end, um, and that these will be long term ten hour parking spaces at 25 cents an hour. So, now you had suggested that you could get permits for these, but uh, they're metered still. They're metered, but, but any, any long-term parking, uh, you can get a, I think it's $45, you can pick up a permit, um, and you can, they're identified by red caps. I've learned this in the last week. All right, the, any of the meters with the red caps, the. Um, 
some permit like, supply. Like, Trump, like Trumbull, there's a bunch off right. of State Street on that right. part of Smith. <clears throat> All right, any more questions about these? It's, I, I, who do I call, Councilor Shera, can I be right? No, you, uh, you take it back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, narrow, it's awfully narrow there, right? Is that one way? That's not one way there, is it? That's Belmont, yeah, it is. It, Belmont is. Belmont's one Belmont, way. Belmont, yes. Oh, that's not a problem, okay. Thank you. Okay. Should we move on, on to the next one? Yep. All right. Uh, let's see, Elm Street. All right, this is this is the big one. Um, there's a number. All right, I want to pull it up here. Get my map. All right, so um, so there's a number of things on Elm Street. First of all, uh, something uh, we're removing the overnight. Uh, parking prohibition uh, for a number of spaces in this area there was a prohibition I think it was from uh, 12 until 6 a.m. Um, so that would be removed uh, again the spaces are going to be better delineated um, also uh, the there's been uh, some rearrangement to better accommodate uh, the bus stops both on the north and south side here um, there's uh, one, uh, the current ordinance has two handicapped spaces uh, near, uh, where is it, uh, Bedford, and that um, the proposal is to split them up so that, you know, that we still have two handicapped spaces in the same area. One is going to be near Bedford and the other is going up near Prospect. Um, let me see. The, and the last thing is um, that we're extending the metered spaces uh, past uh, the um, the Smith College um, campus. Center? Yes, the campus center. It'll end. It, it'll uh, extend up to. I think it's called College Lane. Yes, and um, so that those spaces currently are not metered, and they would be metered. Again, with the the ten hour parking. But, um, quick question: You say better delineated. Do you mean they're going to be line striped, or delineated in terms of explanation of how, what the the parking rules are for a particular space? So that part of what's <laughs> been going on is that the um, the actual parking zones in many of these cases are not. Uh, lined up with the existing conditions. So we saw that I think on Belmont where um, that uh, the, the, you know, people were, uh, the, the parking zone extended right up to the entrance to a parking lot. So uh, those are the types of things that are going on here. And I believe Mr. Mayor, maybe you can help me out, that these will be line striped as well as. as they're metered spaces, they'll be. <clears throat> Um, you're adding seven additional on, on for, by the student center. You're adding seven additional meter parking spaces by my count. From that. Yeah, it looks right. Or eight. One, two, one, two, three, four, eight. Eight. Yes. Okay. Is that pretty much what happens along there? Smith College employees who have parked there in the morning anyway, and like are there? Um, if I could. <clears throat> Please, yes. First, I want to thank Councillor Nash for a level of detail with which he and TCC have looked into this. Uh, I actually think it's a very well thought through series of proposals. <clears throat> and I have uh, reached out to tenants, to Smith folks in the area, and have uh, encountered no opposition to this. The, the, the position of Smith is that they uh, endeavor to have their staff, employees, students park in their in their own facilities in their garage, not on these, uh, not in these places. They have no objections whatsoever to uh, the the slightly different approach to delineating parking spaces and to metering them with 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 long term parking. Uh, so I, I really do think it's a very a very sensible uh, proposal that's not going it, it, and it's actually going to by my count 
add I th over 40, I, I believe, metered parking spaces uh, in, in this little, little area of town. <clears throat> I think it makes sense all the way around. Anything else on this one? Um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is thank the, the mayor's office and Lynn Simmons for all the work that they did pulling this together. And um, yeah, as you can see, it's pretty detailed. Oh, and then we had one more to go through, right? Yeah. West Street. Yeah, West Street. Uh, West Street's a little more straightforward. Uh, so again, um, adding you know meters, delineating the the parking spaces. Just to the north of this, um, the 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 on street parking is metered already, and just across the street from these spaces is where the uh, the the Smith College Visitors Garage is. So it makes sense that you know that we should extend the um, the metered parking further down West Street like this. Any questions on that one? Good. Any further discussion on any of these in the group? Perhaps it's time to vote on. So <clears throat> let's have a roll call on Thank these again. as a group. Thank you, Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Lombard. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. So that all those are approved in first reading. Yep. Finally, um, 19144, an ordinance relative to stop sign on Hampton Avenue. Excuse me. Uh, 19144 in ordinance relative to stop sign Hampton Avenue. First reading. Motion on this, please, for approval. So moved. Second. So simply this adds a stop sign on Hampton Avenue. Um, the direction of travel is northeast at the intersection of Pleasant Street. Um, discussion, Councilor. I'm just going to add to the comment that I had <coughs> in legislative matters. Is I'm, I have no problem approving this, although it seems redundant. Uh, you're required by state law as you pull into it, uh, as you're an intersecting street, to stop. And everyone knows that. In fact, if you don't stop, there are consequences that are pretty clear to everybody. And I didn't realize this is an actual problem. I have no problem putting a stop sign there. It's just an opportunity for someone to put stickers on it at some point. But it, it, I, I get a little nervous when we start throwing stop signs and things. Uh, former uh, DPW director George Andrakides once actually made a very uh, interesting point to me when I was arguing for signs at one point. He said, you on your drive here, on your drive here, Bill, <laughs> you, <laughs> you passed no less than 150 signs. Can you name one of them? And I said, no, I, I can't. And it's, but the point is, is when we, when you create a ubiquity of signs, it, it, it actually runs counter to the purpose that it's intended. I'm fine with this, but as I said, I defied, I don't understand a person who wouldn't stop there. And a stop sign, I don't think it'd make a difference to them one way or the other, but. Is this one of the signs that's already there that just doesn't have an ordinance? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I'll put Councilor Dwight's speech in perspective. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it might be appropriate to develop a sticker of Councilor Dwight, who's already an iconic figure. In the there you go. The the Andre the Giant thing. The thing. Yeah. I, would, I would just defend the stop sign is that we do get a lot of visitors who come in and out of the city and park in the garage. Like it's where, our, it's where our garage is. So for people that know Northampton, like sure, you'd be stupid to like just gun it out of that street. But um, as the fo as the police have told us, I'm, I'm out of, a lot of out of towners, even on Fulton, like just think, oh, I'm just gonna drive right out of here. Um, <laughs> I actually but, agree with that. I think yeah. if, if you're there and you try to look left, which you're not allowed to turn left, right? Like it's hard to see the cars coming in because the other cars block it. So I, I actually think, yeah, that makes sense if you're right. But I mean, if the sign's already there, it really does deserve yeah. an ordinance to support it. <laughs> then again, like, I didn't even remember there was a stop sign there. Exactly. So there you go. Any other discussion? Uh, oh, yeah. I just want to add that 
DPW has also added a directional arrow on the pavement to only go right, which for most people, they don't see that no left turn across the street on the utility pole. And, um, and I think it's a great addition along mm -hmm. with the stop sign. All righty. <laughs> so we're getting punchy. Uh, any other discussion on this last and final ordinance? Okay. So let's, hearing none, let's have a roll call, please. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor White. Yeah, sure. Yes. Councillor Yes. 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 Okay, that's proven in first reading. Any new business this evening? I uh, request a moment of motion to adjourn. Okay, is there a second? Second. second. Okay, all the, any opposed to adjournment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night. Thank you. <laughs>